just by way of introduction, I'd like to say, say a few words. So Niels has um, undergraduate background in music, Royal Academy of Music trained, music theory and, and an organist as well, I believe. His master's he took at Goldsmiths College, um, University of London, um, the, the Masters of Science Music Mind and Brain program, and then did his PhD at Aarhus University, um, Center for Functional Integrative Science and, and uh, with the Music in the Brain group. And uh, since a PhD, he's done some postdoctoral work, including time at the Ohio State University, um, some time actually um, with me at the Marx Institute, Western Sydney University. And throughout this time, he's, he's been successful in getting generous funding from organizations such as Carlsberg Foundation, Lundbeck Foundation, among others. Um, and now he's assistant professor and fellow at the Aarhus Institute of Advanced Studies. Um, here in Denmark, and of course, also linked to the Center for Music in the Brain. His expertise, um, it's, it's quite impressive uh, in, my, in my view, in the way he blends music theory and analysis with, with concepts from psychology, neuroscience, anthropology, sociology, evolutionary biology, and almost everything um, in between. And, and very recently, um, he's, um, it's kind of a combination, I feel, between research interest and, and service to the broader field, because really um, tackling one of the big, big um, issues that faces all of us globally, um, and in doing so, uh, he together with uh, Melanie Ralph Fuhrman at the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics in Frankfurt founded the Music COVID um, Network. It's an international research network um, dealing with, with musical responses and consequences of the uh, coronavirus pan pandemic. And this is something that he's going to tell us about today. Obviously, a very productive area, given that um, although it feels like it, um, it hasn't been afflicting us for, for such a long time in, in historical terms. And yet, you'll hear um, the impressive amount of work that uh, Niels and colleagues have done on this topic. And the title of his presentation is The Corona Music Phenomenon as a Window into the Potential Adaptive Function of Topically Tailored Musical Repertoires. Please take it away, Niels. Thank you very much, Peter, for the very, um, very, very nice and generous press, um, 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 introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be with you here uh, today. Um, uh, we, we've already seen a lot of very exciting presentations this morning, I think, and there's, there's a lot more to come. So I'm, I'm just really excited to be here and really, really excited to, to have the opportunity to, to talk about something slightly different, perhaps, from, from, uh, from what we've been talking about for the last few hours, na namely what I call the Corona music phenomenon. And I'm going to, you know, both re review um, that research area in very general terms, and I'll, I'll also try to relate it a bit speculatively, perhaps to some um, uh, discussions about adaptive functions of, of uh, music in human evolution. So let's get started with that. So um, let me see. Yeah, so um, perhaps the hardest top topic in uh, music science at the moment is the, is the discussion about what, what music's adaptive functions are, if it, if it has any at all. Um, and then, and although much of the focus has been on the two recent target articles in, in the behavioral and brain sciences, who focus on uh, social bonding and credible signaling and have, have hypotheses about that, there, there were actually a total of 60 um, commentaries on, on, on this topic um, that were submitted. And as confirmed by Henk Henkian Honing's survey of the authors afterwards, uh, we can see that researchers hold a wide range of informed opinions about this matter. So we don't all agree on, on one or the other. Um, in our own commentary, um, Peter Keller and I attempted to re review and classify all these evolutionary theories into six main categories group cohesion and co coping, sexual attraction, infant caregiver bonding, coalition uh, signaling, coordinated labor, and civilizational mnemonics. And then we, we argue that a unifying neurohormonal mechanistic framework was needed, um, and we propose that oxytocin may play a part in this puzzle. But, but that's, that's really a story for another time. But I want to say that the, the diversity of theories and arguments really suggests that, that music may have, uh, in fact, multiple adaptive functions. And in this light, it seems warranted to keep an eye uh, open out for possible new functions and further sub-functions that we may not yet have 
identified. Um, uh, for example, here you see the group cohesion and coping are, are grouped together in the same category, but is it perhaps possible that these functions may crystallize into two separate categories later on? I think that might be the case. Um, so when you search for evolutionary forces at play, um, of course, it, we, we may benefit from looking at societal crisis or apparent threats to human civilization as we know it, and the novel coronavirus pandemic, which may now finally be coming to an end, we'll see, is a, is a prime example of this, really. So in this talk, I will review the research and musical activities during the coronavirus uh, lockdowns at large, but, uh, but then I will also subsequently discuss what, the, discuss what the corona music phenomenon might have to say about the functions of music in human evolution. So big, big scope, how we'll see how we, how we get uh, with that. So I'll, I'll take you back to, you know, um, the 11th of March, 2020, where the WHO declared a, a global pandemic um, uh, based on the novel co coronavirus uh, outbreak. And we remember how we had to learn about, you know, uh, flattening the curves. We saw how, you know, so something that looked like one of the worst uh, financial crises uh, was, was, you know, coming uh, towards us. We saw sports facilities being turned into temporary hospitals and these dramatic images from, from uh, North Italy of, of uh, trucks uh, driving out of the city with, uh, with dead bodies, essentially. Um, there was a lot of you know emotional reactions, and the healthcare systems were were uh, overburdened during this time, and still are in many ways. So, um, of course, that resulted in some lockdowns that uh, then again uh, led to a, to what you could call a mental health uh, epidemic. Um, we we see that there are severe deteriorations in stress, anxiety, depression panic attacks, um, emotional disturbance, sleep disorders, lots of different uh, um, problems that people were dealing with. However, as the, as the literature now is kind of, um, you know, uh, falling uh, into places, we see that, that, that these deteriorations were, were really very specific to certain groups of the population. So people who were young, female, single, separated, divorced, at low education levels, negative coping styles, or suffered from uh, chronic or, or other mental health illnesses, they were really the, the ones who suffered the most. So that's important to remember that not everyone uh, had, uh, you know, mental health problems, but as a society in general, there were some severe problems here. Yeah. Um, we, of course, our governments were all very busy with dealing with the with the uh, urgent health crisis, so they didn't have much time um, uh, or energy to, to spend on, you know, de dealing with the mental health issues, at least at the beginning of the pandemic. So coping became very much an individual matter, something for the individual to solve on their own. And this is where artistic creative activities such as di digital arts and writing, crafts, uh, reading for pleasure and music, of course, uh, turned out to play an important role. And we know already from the research that people who, especially people who are young, highly educated, had a, a large extent of social support and were generally worried about getting infected. Those were the ones who, who used these uh, artistic creative activities the most. Um, good, so this of course resulted in the phenomenon that I have coined Corona music. And I did define this as the diverse practices of listening to, playing, dancing to, composing, rehearsing, improvising, discussing, exploring and innovating musical products during lockdown with explicit or implicit reference to the novel coronavirus and or pandemic life circumstances. So as you will see, it's a very broad definition of what corona music is. And I think that's that's uh, needed here to understand what's what's really going on. And of course, this uh, sees musicking as, yeah, as a verb, as something that you can practice in all kinds of different ways, not just by listening to or playing music, but also by discussing music online and composing music and so on. So, so all, all these examples here of, you know, TikTok dance challenges, nurses singing in the hospitals, virtual choirs and ensembles, balcony singing, uh, you know, uh, families connecting via the internet with music and so on. All these are examples of what we call Corona music. Good. So, so I'll just bring up a, one example from my own country here in uh, Denmark. Um, just like um, Anna, I like to you know uh, remind people where you are. I'm sitting in Aarhus, Denmark, and we experienced an an, an interesting development during during lockdown, where 
where morning singing on television be became something that a very large proportion of the population uh, engaged in. And within two weeks of the first lockdowns, we had this uh, Friday primetime television program that was that that got the, the number one viewership uh, for, for six weeks in a row. So we had more than one million people watching this. And they, that's somewhere between one fourth and one fifth of the total Danish population who were watching this uh, singing together uh, TV show. Um, on television, so if, you know, this is something really, uh, really remarkable happened here. And and our own Prime Minister Mette Frederiksen really understood how to capitalize on this. I think um, here you'll hear her uh, peeling potatoes at home and uh, and uh, watching the the uh, the TV program. So um, she, she really understood to uh, capitalize on this, and as I, as I said, and with videos like this, she increased her Instagram following to 400 people, which covers uh, 400,000 people, which covers about 20% of young Danes. So the government in this way could really reach out to, to, the, to the population. I'm um, sorry, it keeps on playing. Um, and some, some people have perhaps argued, you know, that, that Denmark fared relatively well during the pandemic. And, and you, you could, you know, discuss uh, this musical mobilization that we experienced. Could that somehow underlie, uh, you know, the, the high, um, you know, vac vaccine, um, uh, uh, you know, um, support for, for vaccines and tests and, and lockdowns and so on. Okay. Anyway, so if we go back to the early days of the music COVID, um, a research era. Uh, we, we, we were some people who were connecting on Twitter back then and it discussing, okay, what is the, what are these new videos coming out? How can we kind of do research on this, on this topic together um, in lockdown? And it, it, this is when Melanie Val Furman and I uh, established this, this global music COVID research network where we have about 400 members from 250 universities and a few companies in 45 countries worldwide and um, um, so so really you know covering the whole um, the whole world just like the the virus uh, does and um, and we have a we're maintaining a curated list of ongoing projects we release regular new newsletters and we host a symposium at the icmpc conference uh, in J july right last year and what uh, our, our reason for doing this was that we wanted to, we saw that everyone was interested in answering these basic questions about are people listening more to music and so on. And um, so we wanted to, to, uh, to join forces and avoid redundancy, avoid everyone making the same uh, studies um, in, in ways where we could nurture research ideas together. And this would then improve the scientific quality, which we believe put us in a better position to solve societal uh, challenges, essentially. So this is what you see in research, many areas of research that people are, are, are joining together. And this, we, we saw that quite excitingly ha happening in our um, area as well. Good. So one, one of the other things we did was that we uh, um, guest edited this uh, special um, issue research topic with Frontiers uh, to, together with Melanie and uh, Jane Davidson from uh, Melbourne. Um, and uh, we here published 44 articles with contributors from lots of different fields. A lot of, uh, you know, really, uh, really intelligent uh, people from our uh, field where really took part and uh, contributed to, to this. And one of the exciting things was that we, we didn't have to pay to publish uh, COVID related research. So that meant that we could include uh, uh, people um, from, from parts of the world that we not, uh, don't always see at our own conferences. Good. And so, so, so having been an editor in this and ha having kind of uh, coordinated some things that put me in a, in a position to, 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 to write the two first literature reviews that I'm uh, aware of uh, that kind of tries, try to summarize the use of COVID research literature. They are both um, uh, intended uh, as uh, chapters for various book volumes coming out in the next year, hopefully. Um, but they're, they're both accessible on, uh, on, uh, on the SCI archive. Um, in the first one, uh, I re re relate the results to, to the concepts of hedonia and eudaimonia and, and try to have a discussion along those lines. And in a, in a recent 
a chapter that I just um, put out uh, yesterday. Actually, uh, we review this um, this uh, this research as well, and I also you know talk a bit about this dangerous situation that I that I mentioned before, and do a bit of qualitative analysis on the, on what the Corona music phenomenon is and so on. So so feel free to check that out if you if you want to. Good. So, um, so, so let's start off by kind of uh, drawing a timeline of what happens. So, um, um, here you see the pandemic declaration of the 11th of, of March, and you see here um, um, that there are already some travel restrictions in place in February, but the primary uh, increase in lockdown measures really occur, occurred around the this time around the 11th of March, and it remained high throughout, and 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 these uh, measures are still in place some some places now, almost two years later. Um, here you see individual trajectories for all countries in the world um, of the so-called Oxford Stringency Index um, from the Oxford Government Response Tracker, as well as a global mean, which is the uh, the dashed line here. So while we unfortunately don't have a longitudinal data from early pandemic days, we, we, we can see that depressive symptoms appear to have followed these lockdown measures a bit. So when it goes up, they go up, and when it goes down, they go down. And these, uh, the, we had an average in the mild depression range. Um, another thing I did was to look at uh, Google Trends, so looking at music and corona. When did people uh, search for these terms? And then we really see that the peak of Corona music was really during the early days of the pandemic. So before the lockdowns, right before the lockdowns and a few few months into the first uh, lockdown. So already by uh, by by June or so, um, people search searches here had kind of uh, returned to a to a to a normal level, which is probably around the same now. So when we're studying Corona music, we should really be looking at these three months from the 1st of February to the 1st of May. Or maybe June, and therefore the the survey studies that were conducted the the earlier during this time they happen, the more um, the the more um, interesting they are for interpreting what Corona music is. So if we dive into this uh, literature, we have objective measures of streaming behavior, um, and then we have you know from streaming services and so on, and then we have more subjective self-report measures from survey studies. Um, and quantitatively, we can see that um, that uh, Spotify listening, for instance, actually de decreased dramatically during lockdown. So, um, so you see the orange line here is the pandemic year, and, and blue is the previous year. So we see that it really decreased by a lot. But there are a lot of differences between different countries. So here we see Denmark and the Philippines, for instance. Um, and the reason for this is probably that we can relate these. Uh, it decreases in streaming quite di directly to uh, to commuting and mobility patterns, but also to lockdown restrictions and, and the number of COVID cases. So, so because perhaps you have longer to travel to work in the Philippines than you do in Denmark, um, uh, uh, Spotify listening may have increased more here. At the same time, however, we, we saw that uh, YouTube streaming seems to have increased during the pandemic year. So, so um so there's something you know people are switching from the audio only to the audio visual um, um platforms good so what happens if we ask people did you listen <laughs> more to music during lockdown then most people will report that they increased their listening happening uh, um habits during during lockdown but but there are also some studies that report no to little change and the studies that do report overall change you see here in, in green uh, there are also lots of respondents who decreased so it shows that you know there, there's a lot of individual uh, var variation here um, and it's important to note also that there's similar decreases for many other things so people also uh, cooked more cleaned more and did, did you know activities in their own home simply because they had more time uh, singing and, and dancing is also rated as, as very efficient for for coping, but singing and dancing was hard to do during lockdown, whereas listening was indeed uh, something you can do very safely um, alone at home. Um, so, so, so these two kind of um, uh, qualitative and, and quantitative uh, findings kind of uh, allude to perhaps some, some qualitative differences in musical engagement during lockdown. So maybe people were listening with more attention, Maybe maybe there are some individual differences as I talked about. Maybe people had different motivations for listening during lockdown, and maybe they listened to different types of music during lockdown. 
So luckily, we had quite early on during the uh, the lockdown designed a, a large international uh, study uh, asking people about their, their musical engagement habits during lockdown. And we here have dem demographically representative samples from France, Germany, India, Italy, Italy, uh, the, the UK, and from uh, New, New York State in the US. And after cleaning the data, we had about 5,000 respondents in a, to a Qualtrics survey. And, and the data here were collected relatively early in the lockdown. So I think that's, that, uh, that's, that's important to know. Um, we, we, uh, we then found some interesting cultural uh, differences. So, so that, that's what is referred to as an acquiescence bias, which means that uh, people in, in India have a, have a tendency to just rate a lot of things more positively than people in, in some other countries, for instance. So we had to, to rank our means within countries uh, in a way so that we could um, compare across the different countries. We, we also did some exploratory factor analysis where we looked at all of our variables and identified six overall factors, negative emotions, um, you know, relating to negative emotions, positive emotions, age, living situations, employment, and, and a few things like that. Um, but our main an analysis was, was, a, um, was a, a light a, a gradient boosted machine um, a, a modeling, a regression modeling. Uh, where we try to predict, um, you know, social emotional coping. So how much did people benefit from engaging with music, predicting that from all the other changes in people's motivations and behaviors and so on. Good. So first, let's look at some um, uh, descriptive statistics here. We see that um, musical activities ranked highly. So, so people did uh, you know, uh, musical engagement were one of the things that people seem to do uh, more during lockdown, but they also seem to call people more, uh, read and watch more news and movies and clean and cook, as I said before. So, so you know, music is not the only thing you can do, but one of them. When people listen to music, they tended to do it alone when they're doing ho housework, uh, but also when doing nothing else, for instance. And when they made music, they also typically did it alone. Um, but also sometimes singing together with others at home, if there are others at home, or singing or playing with others via the internet. If we look at people's motivations for engaging with music and the, specifically the changes in people's motivations for engaging with music, we see that both when it comes to music making and music listening, some of the motivations that increased the most were really the ones that had to do with emotion regulation. So uh, the fact that music is enjoyable, helps you relax, puts you in a good mood, energizes you, reduces your stress levels, and um, supports you in a, in a bad uh, mood, distracts you, things like that. They, these were really the highest ranking uh, uh, functions in terms of, uh, of uh, change. Um, good, so, so then to the main analysis here. Um, um, so so what, what we have here is a, is a, a SHAP plot where, where you know, the, uh, the, the numbers on the axis here says, uh, for each of these variables, how much do they contribute to predicting um, uh, uh, predicting a social emotion and coping uh, with music? And one of the interesting things we can see here with our models, explaining about 54% uh, of the variance, is that the 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 really most the really strongest predictor of social emotional coping is people's interest in others' corona music behavior. So it, it seems like the people who were really interested in this new phenomena and engaged with them in different ways were also the ones who benefited the most from music. So it, it alludes to a possible role for this uh, topically tailored repertoire that really, you know, music that really talks about pandemic life circumstances as, as maybe playing an important role here. Um, and then the, uh, the factor analysis I talked about before uh, also found a very interesting connection between, you know, the people who experience negative emotions, they used mostly music for solitary emotional regulation and the people who were more optimistic and experienced positive emotions, they saw music as a proxy for social interaction. So it, it suggests that there's some kind of bifurcation in the way that people were using music and we will come back to how that might manifest. Good. Of course, there are lots of other studies uh, conducted on pandemic coping with music. We know from these studies that at least half of the population used music for coping, so a very big proportion of the population. Music was also rated as the most effective activity when it comes to achieving well-being goals. And 
oftentimes it was outperforming, you know, watching TV, series, moving, um, mo movies, uh, reading, and, and physical exercise. Um, the extent to which people, uh, to, to which music was important for people was a really important factor here, which we also saw in the uh, data that I just presented. Um, but interestingly here, life satisfaction correlates positively with music listening, but negatively with watching TV. So the people who, who watch a lot of TVs generally had lower life satisfaction and the people who, who listen to a lot of music generally had higher life satisfaction. Um, another study also found that psychological distress correlates negatively with listening during, during lockdown, but not before lockdown. So there was something uh, uh, going on here under lockdown that's a bit special. Apparently, and um, when it comes to the music that people were selecting uh, to listen to or play, we see some evidence for that people explored new styles and artists during lockdown. Uh, some people, if you ask them, a lot of people report listening to more nostalgic music. Um, and there's an in interesting study with about 17 uh, trillion Spotify plays uh, that, uh, that uh, um, uh, operationalized nostalgic music listening as listening to music that's older than three years old. And these kinds of analysis also show that, that there's a tendency in many countries for people to listen to more uh, older music during lockdown than they did um, um, otherwise. And there's a, there was a lot of control analysis that, that suggests that this is real, a real phenomenon. Good. When it comes to this topic, the Taylor Corona music, as I talked about, um, more than half uh, self-reported uh, moderate to extreme interest in this uh, type of music. In uh, Israel, the, the numbers were even higher. And in, in Spain, we also have evidence that people participated in Corona music, so balcony singing and things like that. And we saw, of course, an increase in live streaming engagement. Good. So, so that brings us to the second study uh, that I want to present, which is the Corona Music Database. Um, so this is really an, an attempt to, to collect Corona Music so that we have something to study, essentially. Um, and luckily, early on during the, during the lockdown, within the first two weeks or so, I started crowdsourcing examples of Corona Music, first via Google Sheets and then via a survey exact uh, survey. And um, then when we had all the crowdsource data, we supplemented it with retrospective sampling, making sure that we have at least five videos per day in this February to April uh, uh, time span. Um, so we, we were essentially searching on, on uh, YouTube, trying to um, reproduce the cultural bias that we already had in our sample, but just increase the sample size in this way. Um, all the video examples were coded by at least two coders and conflicts were resolved in a systematic way. We were coding some basic information about what it was, where it was published and so on, um, but also some, some other variables about whether were people making, making music together, was it original songs, original lyrics, were people moving, were, were they talking about health info, uh, was there any conflict and so on. Um, and also some open coded variables about setting the genre of the music, various emotions and so on. Um, and uh, we, we got a reasonably good representation. So here you see the plot that I showed earlier on also with the, with the Google Trends and the, uh, and the lockdown um, stringency. And we see that we have, um, we have videos for, for, for most of the interesting period. And we also have media reports from most of this periods. Um, and in, in, you know, geographically, we had a relatively okay spread. We have a lot of ex uh, videos from the US, from the UK, Denmark, Australia, Israel, Italy, and so on. Um, but we also have some from, from other parts of the world. Um, Dana Swarbrick, who was involved in this project, uh, has, has designed this, this very nice um, a, a shiny app online where you can explore our, our data. And so you can go to that link or find it in our uh, paper and, and with Frontiers. And, and then you can explore these variables and see why, how was it exactly in your country and so on. Good, so looking first at some descriptive statistics from this study, we can see that uh, emotions like togetherness and being moved were really prominent in this repertoire. Um, and also that positive emotions like happiness, hope, and humor uh, played, a, played a huge role, perhaps more so in the, even more so in the videos than, than in the media reports. Um, 
people were making home uh, music at home primarily, and of course, unsurprisingly, not so much in music venues and studios. Um, and perhaps more surprisingly, uh, bal balcony music making was perhaps less prominent in this, these videos than you, than you uh, think, because it got a lot of media exposure during this time. Um, but also a lot of uh, uh, music making outside and, and online, of course. It was uh, primarily uh, English language lyrics and so on, and the, the musical genres applied correspond reasonably well to what people listen to in the, in, in the US, for instance. And here's some word clouds for the media data and the video features. Good. So if you're curious about co Corona music, I've, I've collected this uh, Corona music playlist on YouTube that you can find following this uh, link where I have curated, I think, about 16 good examples of Corona music in the general playlist description. There are some notes about, you know, what what the music is. Um, and I've tried to kind of provide a spread of different uh, different types of music. So there's both some some uh, some uh, uh, virtual choirs and ensembles, but also something from from East Asia, for instance, and um, some of these um, uh, um, a, you know, co 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 Corona um, contrafactor, so like new new lyrics uh, for songs, um, uh, nurses dancing, and 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 so on. Good. So feel free to have a look at that. So when I look at all these videos, kind of qualitatively, and try to understand what are the main themes happening here, my my analysis is as follows. So so as I mentioned before, people's engagement with music seems to be very active multimodal, so people are both dancing and, and making music, for instance. Uh, people seem to be listening in an attentive way, seems to be quite uh, creative, um, and there's a lot of focus on here and now, so like the, the liveness is really important in this music. Um, and uh, agency is attributed to the collective, so music is something we make together. We, we Our identity is that we co-create music together, and Amateurs play a huge role in this music. And the kind of interactions you see are very informal, authentic, um, intimate. Even you get to see, uh, you know, famous musicians' uh, homes and so on during this time. Um, and a lot of the music happens uh, at home or, or outside also. Um, and the, the lyrics typically talk about, you know, pandemic life itself, the simplicities and trivialities of, you know, running out of toilet paper or whatever. Um, and the site's sentiment seems to be very positive and perhaps even positively biased. Uh, humor plays a huge role here. So uh, when it comes to positive effect, we know that the positive effect on humor is linked with um, uh, resilience and it can effectively reduce anxiety. So could this be kind of a coping mechanism, this um, positive bias or positivity bias? So that, that, of course, raises the question whether these trends towards this positivity bias hold true in more objective sentiment analysis of large text and audio corpora from a, from a multitude of social and public news media platforms. And this is what we looked at in the third uh, study, where we, um, um, where we yeah, looked at this research question, was there a positive effective bias in Corona music? Um, within this uh, specific time frame. And we were here looking at uh, Spotify playlists, uh, tweets from Twitter, subreddits from Reddit, music related subreddits, um, uh, comments to some of these Corona music videos on YouTube, and a large corpus of uh, news, um, as you will see. And we then uh, quantified the sentiment, so how positive, how negative is it, uh, using the uh, valence audio features for, for the Spotify, um, uh, playlists and and the the uh, um, for for the text corpora we use the natural language uh, toolkits uh, Vader analyzer for the social media data which is it's optimized for and the Sensi word net for the news data which is better at handling longer uh, sentences and and, and longer um, uh, texts. Good. So looking first at the Spotify data, we here sourced about almost 10,000 Corona themed playlists, focusing on the ones that had more than just one follower, so more than just the person in, uh, producing them. And these were identified with some um, COVID related uh, search terms. And we then contrasted that with a large data set uh, from the so-called music streaming sessions data set of general 
uh, music on Spotify. We then, uh, you know, extracted the audio features and and uh, performed k-means clustering on these conducted world's teeth tests as well. So if we look at valence here, um, we see that the corona music compared to the non-corona music does indeed have a significantly higher valence. So it is more positive than the music that people generally listen to on uh, Spotify. Um, and, but when we did this, this k-means clustering, we really saw that there are two different types of corona music. The, uh, the red type cluster one here, which is really high loudness, high energy, high danceability, relatively fast tempo and so on, which is a kind of um, a, um, a corona party music. And then the, the contrasting type of music was the cluster uh, zero here, the, uh, the purple lines where, where, where acousticness was a lot higher and, and the people, the music was a lot more reflective. Um, so it's again kind of su suggesting that there might be some, some bifurcation happening here. And when, when we look at this, this, the, uh, the valence of these specific subclusters, we see that the Corona party music is even more positive than general Corona music and the Corona chill music is even uh, more negative, you could say, or even less positive than the, than the non-Corona uh, music. Good. Moving on to Twitter, um, we here identified a, a, a corpus of uh, COVID-related uh, tweets where we um, distinguish between a music corpus of about 140,000 tweets identified with 102 music-related terms and, and then a non-music-related uh, corpus of uh, 16 million tweets. Um, and for all of these, we had the user location, uh, which is really, really interesting and comes in handy. Um, we see here that music tweets overall exhibited more positive sentiment than non-music tweets. So here you see with uh, re retweets where you see some of the spikes here when there's a specific uh, music tweet that becomes very popular. Um, but even if you, if, you, if you don't include those re retweets, you still see that, that uh, music tweets are more positive than non-music tweets. Um, and we can attribute this to more positive and less negative sentiment. So here's the uh, distribution of, of sentiment in the two corpora. Of course, as I said before, we have some location data and that raises the question, what was really the temporal dynamics of this uh, positivity bias uh, happening? So here you see positivity bias in green and negativity bias in, in red. And here's an attempt to kind of describe what happened um, over the early weeks of the pandemic, where you see in the beginning, there's a tendency for you know, negativity bias to begin in Australia, China, and so on. And then it kind of switches to a positivity uh, bias, but the dynamics are not really clear. And we are, we are at trying to uh, get at analyzing this and figuring out what's really going on. Um, and one of the things that we did uh, do recently is that we replicated this, these uh, positivity bias findings in with a more context sensitive pre-trained model, the so called BERT uh, model developed by people at Google. And we see here with the music related tweets that, that, that there's, there's more positive tweets and fewer negative tweets compared to the non-music related tweets. And here we can also quantify different emotions where we see that it's driven by more joy in the music related tweets and perhaps less fear and disgust in the music related tweets. And what's really interesting here is that the positivity bias increases significantly with, with a greater lockdown uh, stringency. So the more people are under lockdown, the, the, the more um, this bias towards positivity in music compared to general, um, uh, general tweets seems to, seems to become prominent. So both music related and non-music related tweets actually become more positive the more uh, lockdown you have, but the music related tweets become even more positive than the other uh, tweets. So it seems to be, you know, could be a reaction to, to this, uh, to being on the lockdown. Good. So when it comes to the Reddit data, we uh, looked at comments to posts in uh, two subreddits, one called Let's Talk Music, and another one called Listen to This. Um, and we compared here uh, what happened in March to May 2020 to what happened in the same months in 2019. And what we see here is a bit, little bit um, more unclear because in the Let's Talk Music uh, uh, subreddit, you do see that sentiment became significantly more positive 
um, in 2020 compared to 19. But in the listen to this, you you see the opposite direction. So so um, um, these discussions became more uh, negative here. So again, you could discuss is it this bifurcation when you know when you're discussing music, sharing music with others. You are doing it in a more positive way during lockdown, but when it comes to recommending what you should listen to on your own um, as an individual for your own emotional reg regulation, then the the uh, recommendations and the and the talks about music become more negative um, potentially. When it comes to YouTube comments, we identified uh, 319 um, English lyrics, Corona music videos. Um, and then we uh, we looked at all the the 63,000 comments to these videos and matched them up with a, a same number of videos that were non-corona related by the same uh, the same uh, uh, channels uh, with the same number of comments views and so on um, and um, yeah here's some some word clouds you can say there's a lot of see there's a lot of focus on stay thank corona and so on whereas traditional as songs they tend to you know talk about love and liking and so on um uh, there's a tendency for the uh, for the uh, uh, for the target uh, comments here to have more words in them but it's not significant and perhaps more um, interestingly here um, there's not a significant difference it's not uh, significant at least between corona uh, uh, comments to corona uh, videos and, and control videos um yeah, um, but I mean, we, we, we do have some issues with, with matching here because some of the Corona music videos were presented on new channels um, and, you know, some were presented on channels where music was not being uh, presented before um, some old channels were revived and so on. So it so, 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 so suggests that maybe we need to do some more systematic work here. Good. Then finally, the last corpus looking at news on the web. Um, we identified music related articles from 2020 and 19. And then we identified control articles that has had nothing to do with music during these two same uh, years uh, match approximately. And these were then pre processed in different ways, and then analyzed for sentiments. And here we see that there's a non significant uh, trend perhaps towards higher sentiment in music compared to non-music tweets in 2020, which, you know, at first sight seems promising. But if you look at 2019, we actually see that this, this um, positivity bias is, was stronger back then. So we see that sentiment has risen both in, a, in, in a, a music news and other news during um, a lockdown. But, but this increase was actually more, more in the in a, in a non uh, non music news so this goes a little bit against what we were expecting um, but again you know there could be some challenges in the way that we controlled here because a lot of our music articles were you know published on uh, by news sources that only deal with music so it can be really hard to find non music uh, sources for instance but you know it's a complex picture trying to figure it out good so to conclude we do seem to see this positivity bias. It's a small to moderate, at least um, in Corona music in online. Um, it seems to be geographically widespread. Um, and very interestingly, I think it seems to increase with the stringency of the lockdown that you're under. Um, news, general news sentiment may have increased as well. So that's something we need to factor in. Um, and there's some evidence for this stylistic bifurcation in the Spotify and Reddit data, at least between this energetic party, Corona music. And you could ask, is this the one that, you know, the people who felt positive emotions are, are using? And this sad chill Corona music, which you could ask, is that the one that the people experiencing negative emotions are, are, um, are experiencing? And we, we, are, we are now planning some work to look at into this more specifically. Um, there are some methodological challenges, as I as I said. Um, so we can conclude perhaps that positively biased Corona music may have caused these short-term mental health benefits um, through reducing anxiety and regulating emotions. And this could have facilitated problem-oriented long-term coping. Um, when we look at the phenomenon overall, the Corona music phenomenon overall, we can see that music certainly played a significant role in the early pandemic coping, at least half of the population used it actively. 
and it worked at least as well as other leisure activities and often better than you know it seems at least better than uh, than watching movies and so on um and it's it seems to be true for diverse cultural contexts and music provided both uh, you know a tool for mood regulation and for collective uh, cohesion as we saw and these distinct functions were associated with negative and positive emotions corona theme music was widely created and consumed as we saw and it was associated with enhanced coping through music so the people who who engage with these this new musical phenomenon were also the ones who benefited the most from music good so here at the very end speculatively since the, for this event i i've sensed that we might be reaching out to to uh, to people outside our own research field i'll, I'll try to kind of uh, speculate a little bit about what we can what we can use this for um and I guess um, you know it's possible that in the context of these evolutionary models of music, that topically tailored music, um, such as Corona music, could be an adaptive function for tackling societal and existential crises throughout human history and evolution. So, is it possible that whenever um, um, uh, you know um, our ancestors experienced a, a, a natural ca catastrophe or a war or a pandemic, if um, for that matter, that they composed music, sang songs that that helped them process with this uh, crisis. That, that's a very interesting idea, I think, which need calls for further exploration. So during this um, pandemic, we saw that the co Corona music was really um, bottom up. It really the, 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 the citizens produced the Corona music to cope. Um, and we see that on social media and, and so on. And as I said, in the meantime, the society or the government was involved in, you know, handling the pandemic in uh, general and also providing, for instance, financial support programs for mus musicians and so on. So what in the context of this re research, what we can ask is whether the next time a pandemic or a crisis hits, is there a way for us to to get society or get the government or whatever to to uh, to 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 top down, make use of these uh, beneficial effects that music seems to have. So could you use music in telemedicine? Could you make musical apps, have composers in a residence so at the same time providing work for the uh, musicians who are out of work? Uh, could you commission new works that collectively process this crisis? Um, could you use music for, for public health uh, com communication as we saw some brilliant examples of during lockdown? Um, could you use music in the virtual classroom? Um, you know, cu curate uh, virtual concerts, uh, make musical visits to the lonely or elderly and so on. So this is just the kind of a catalog of ideas um, for things that musicians could do in the next uh, crisis, hopefully. Good. So with this, I will end by thanking my uh, uh, funders, as well as the survey study team, Lauren Fink, Lindsay Warrenberg, Cleo Howlin, Will Randall, Melanie Valfurman, uh, the, this team for the second study, Melvin Trider, Dana Swarbrick, Josh Bamford, Johanna Wilson, and Jonas Wyskowski. And finally, the, the team for the social media research, uh, Rebecca Balini, Anita, Anita Kurm, Lasse Damko, Ia Jakobsen, Sarah Colling, Louis Yu, and Ola Mellon. And thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Neil. It's a great example of, of making the best of a challenging situation in terms of, of um, you know, research activity. So if, quite a few questions have popped up. I'll, I'll start to transfer them, if that works, to, um, to the Zoom so you can see them too. Well, one is a bit of a discussion that uh, um, Pat, Pat started. Um, where, where is the Wellerman? Um, users that may, maybe um, was out of the time scope of the study or, or missed it when he was putting um, the kids to sleep. Um, and then Josh follows up that he thought that the Wellman craze only started after the sample window for the for the database and to do a follow up. What is that? Is that the case? Yeah, that's um, that's accurate. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, um, Pat. Um, where is the Wellman? Um, yeah. So, so I mean, this really happened. If I remember, I mean, Pat knows this better than I do, but I think it was maybe in the late summer that year or something. I, I feel like it was after, um, and when I say summer, I mean North Hemisphere summer. Um, I feel like it was after our sampling period that the um, that the sea shanties craze really happened. Um, but I'm I'm super curious. So, so it's not something that we've looked at uh, 
here, but I'm I'm super curious what what Pat thinks about you know does do do these sea shanties have a have a role in um, in um, evolution or in coping or or what exactly is an an example of I'm I'm really I'm, I'm really curious about about this because again you know it was definitely something it was definitely a very participatory thing you know people were creating and sharing with each other building on each other's uh, material as we saw were characteristics for corona music uh, and doing so in a humoristic and very positive way um so so you know it's it seems to fit fit all the criteria or whatever you're going to call it for corona music so I, so i think that could be an, a very really interesting case study to look at this phenomenon as well Right, and Sarah has a question about the tweet analysis. So with the tweet analysis, is there a control for sarcasm or valence ambiguous tweets? Yeah, yeah, so then this is a, this is a, a, this is a problem with the, um, with the first uh, type of analysis that we used, which was like um, a lexicon based. So it's essentially just identifying words that are either positive or negative. Um, but actually, the the second analysis that we we uh, the, when we replicated our results with the birds uh, model, if I understand co correctly, that's more uh, context sensitive and should perhaps be able to to pick up things like um, sarcasm um, um, or yeah, I mean, valence ambiguous tweets are all over the place, and I mean, we get a lot of um, tweets that end up in the you know a neutral category when in fact you know. It's it's real com communication that's a lot more subtle and new nuanced than, than uh, what you see here. But I, I my understanding is that the, the bird model uh, handles some of these uh, things. But of course, we we should look at some of these um, uh, tweets, you know, with um, with human eyes and uh, and check that uh, that uh, that 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 we're doing the right thing. Right. The next one, Anna asks, uh, well, Anna's wondering if there were differences between people living alone and people living with others. Do they use music differently? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't remember how that goes, how that exactly plays together with these kinds of things. But that, that's definitely definitely something we, we could we could look into quite easily with our with our data set. Um, so one one of the um, factors that did came up it did come up uh, in the exposure effects analysis was was uh, was living um, a living situation. Um, so so there's there's definitely something going on there. But how that it relates to you know. Um, a positive and negative emotions and you know solitary listening versus a, a collective uh, music creation I'm, I'm not completely sure about that but uh, but you know definitely if you don't have anyone else around you you can't uh, make music or listen to others uh, listen to music with others alone um although i have to say we, we did see some uh, phenomena so for instance there's been music listening parties on uh, on Twitter and elsewhere, where people were listening to old old uh, albums um, um, to, together, so so actually, you know, listening together with the with the help of the internet is actually possible um, uh, nowadays. So so some people might have done this, but it wasn't that accessible to everyone. So it's a definitely a good question. We will uh, we'll look into that. And now a question from Louisa. If you were to perform a new analysis on retrospective reflective corona music June 2020 to present, would you expect negativity bias instead? Bo Burnham's inside could suggest so. Okay, yeah, I'm I'm not familiar with this inside actually. I, I think if you have a link or something, I would be really curious about that. Um, so whether there's a negativity bias uh, from from the first wave and onwards. Um, <clears throat> I guess that's a that's a that's a hypothesis. I think. I mean, it it it's probably the experience that many people had. You know, that there was a lot of excitement during the early days, um, and 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 that that the later waves were perhaps a little, little bit more <clears throat> trivial and uh, negative. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, people probably also had better. Coping, uh, um, you know, strategies developed better coping strategies for the next lockdowns. Had had better mastering of some of the uh, tech technological tools and so on. So you know, I could see, I could see it um, go either way really. But that that's an that's an interesting uh, 
interesting question. Um, I guess if if positivity bias is kind of a coping mechanism, then you would suggest that it it uh, it doesn't just work for the first wave, but also would work for other wa uh, waves. But uh, you know that's an empirical question that someone would need to need to need to look into. I think. Saki Louis responded to the previous previous issue, just saying that um, we didn't see differences in music use between people living alone and others um, from a from a brief analysis of, of other data. Um, maybe I could ask a question, Neil. Just one thing you mentioned about um, about people making use of music in previous crises. Um, and just from a historical perspective, new new styles of music emerging or new new genres or types of songs and that sort of thing. Um, what would you is there any way from the data you've seen that you could predict um, going forward, like in, in 20, 30, 50, 100 years time, will there be a particular type of music that developed and arose at this point in time during the pandemic? Yeah, so so I mean that that's an interesting question. That's, I mean, it's probably hard to um, to answer, but I can I can speculate, right? And and some of the um, some some of my notes here uh, for this slide actually talk about you know the if the the coronavirus uh, crisis is not at all the only crisis that we're dealing with right now. There's a whole bunch of other crises. There's the the uh, the mental health crisis, okay, probably very related here. There's a climate crisis. There's a biodiversity crisis. There's a trust crisis with fake news and things like that. There's political pol polarization, social justice crisis. You know, all kinds of 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 uh, other crises that that you know where you could imagine could could music per perhaps be used in some kind of way uh, here to um you know to to um. To instigate action or or to to help with the um, coping or conflict resolution. So I mean it, it's it's kind of it's probably not my my place to really um, um, recommend uh, too many specific things. But I, I I can see that that you know music could play a role in some of these other crises as well. Um, and I guess I mean the 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 simplest prediction would be that uh, when the next time when there's a pandemic, we'll see a similar phenomenon but of course we'll be in a completely different tech uh, technological reality at that time as well so you know it's really hard to make predictions when you don't know how how the technology for for as to how people connect um, 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 over distances how, how that develops and so on so that there's not of on there's a lot of unknowns here but but definitely a very interesting uh, uh, interesting discussion yeah and there are a few more comments. I did have one follow up from the the slide you put up. So one of the comments in there is that some people have hinted um, that um, protests, chanting, marching together may be behaviours that help us feel connected. Um, and then another comment from Psyche now um, hearing list the crises. <laughs> yeah. Um, and how music can help us with them is very inspiring. Yeah, indeed. I agree. But just quickly, Niels, with this um, figure you have here with the arrows going up from citizens to um, musical coping um, through corona music and then using that to justify support for all these other things now this is a devil's advocate type point of course i'm for all these other things you <laughs> know in, in a very big way but i'm wondering whether the argument can be made or at least it needs to be considered the um, potential that it was the very fact that citizens were in this situation where they had to execute their agency and 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 be the driver of making this music that was the key to it being in any beneficial effects and if you kind of take this out of their hands and organize it um have an in infrastructure around it, it won't have the same uh, meaning yeah no 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 that that's that's exactly right but i guess some of the you know musicians nowadays are also being trained in how they can um, um, activate and engage uh, their, their audiences, right? So, so, so you you can also support musicians who who you know um, make activities that activate the the citizens. So it's it's not either either the musicians are performing or either the the citizens are, are are performing, but but you can have like co co performance, co compositions. You know, you can you can imagine all kinds of activities, and I think. Musicians in the 21st century are, are really well equipped to to uh, to engage with their audiences in in uh, in um, participatory ways. Yeah, that's a very good uh, concept. So thank you very much again, Neil, for the presentations. Thanks everyone for the lively discussion.